The reason I'm, I want to do that is because I think this is really the most important lecture I'm going to give this year or almost any year. I think it's really, this is a, a problem that um, I think threatens everything we do in medicine today and is only going to get worse. And if we don't figure out how to deal with it, uh, we're in deep doo-doo. So uh, I want to uh, go over this really carefully with you because we all need to figure out what we're going to do. So let me first d define overdiagnosis. Um, anybody want to help? Because it's a, it's a word that has a specific meaning that isn't just the way it sounds. Anybody know what this word is supposed to mean, overdiagnosis? Finding something you don't need to do anything about. Finding something you don't need to do anything about. Right, exactly right. So it's, it's really, so let me, it's a little more than that, okay? Because if you find a false positive, you don't need to do anything about it, but you believe you do. This is a little different. Of overdiagnosis is identifying a disease that pathologically is that disease but which doesn't mean what you think it means. That is to say, if you never found it, it would never act like disease. It would never cause symptoms. And the place we, know, we started to know about this from was prostate cancer. 50 years ago, uh, nobody did screening. Prostate cancer, you got prostate cancer, you were symptomatic, you died. Terrible disease, awful. That continued. Then they figured out a way to screen for it, and they started finding it all the time. And most of the time when they found it, um, it didn't look too bad. The patient was asymptomatic, was screening. And then over years, this, we found lots and lots of prostate cancer, started taking out lots and lots and lots of prostate cancer. The number of people who died from prostate cancer seemed to be exactly the same. There was no change. So it wasn't like you were finding the disease before it got bad. And then throw in, if you do autopsies, routine autopsies on men who are 80 years old who die of something entirely different, 80% of them, if you look, microscopically have prostate cancer. They never knew about it. 90 years old, you die, 90% of them have prostate cancer. If you do autopsies on men who die at 103, 103% of them. <laughs> so, um, so it must mean that these prostate cancers you're finding probably are different than the prostate cancers that are malignant in the sense that we know, we use that word, that go on to kill you. These go on to do nothing. They just sit there. That's where it first started. Uh, there are now many, many, many examples of virtually every cancer this is true for. So the concept was something that under the microscope or in a CT scan looks like the disease. It is the disease. It's not a false positive. It really is prostate cancer, but it doesn't it isn't cancer or it isn't malignant in the sense that we've always thought. If you didn't find it, nothing bad will happen. Now, I'm going to try to uh, suggest to you in the next half hour that this is a really a big problem and that it's way beyond cancer and screening and prostate cancer, although screening is the place where you're most likely to find it. We'll see why in a minute. So let me stop for a second and uh, tell you a story. 30 years ago, <coughs> maybe 30 years, 25 years, 20 years ago, I don't know, 25 years ago, I'm in the UCLA ER, and a friend of mine comes in as a patient. She's a professor in one of the surgical departments, really nice lady. I know she's a surgeon, but what can I tell you? Um, really nice lady. I like this person. And, um, and she comes in directly from LAX, the airport. She has flown into LAX from New York, and she comes straight to the ER. Now, this is a very level-headed, smart person, but she's worried. What is she worried about? She thinks she has a PE. Why does she think she has a PE? Because in the last couple of hours of the flight, she started getting chest pain. So I ask her, What's, tell me about it. So she looks great to me. I mean, she looks fine. So um, she says she's had this little sticking chest pain. It comes for a second. It's a little jolt right there, and then it goes away. And then it came back, and then it goes away. And she's had it a few, you know, a bunch of times. Since she's been down on the ground, probably less, but yeah, I mean, she's really worried. She knows about, you know, she's a surgeon. She knows about peas on long travel. It started at the end of the long travel. She's really concerned. So I, you know, I do the full, my full history and physical, looking for all the things that I know are associated with PE. 
risk factors. Um, she, she was probably in her 40s at the time, young, young lady. No reason to have a PE. I don't think she even was on birth control pills. And nothing about it looked like a PE. She, her vital signs were completely normal. She had no associated symptoms, no shortness of breath. She was normal. And it, this pain is not a PE pain. It was a little, t you know, it was nothing. I thought, you know, she's worried. She had a little, you know, whatever it is. We all get little pains. We mostly ignore them. But she noticed it. Therefore, she noticed it again when it came back. So I was sure this was nothing. I was absolutely confident it was nothing. So I told her that. I said, the good news is you don't have a PE. Everything's fine. You're good. Everything's good. Now, um, this was in the, I think it was probably in the early 90s when we were first starting to, we first were starting to use CTPA to look for pulmonary embolism. Before that, making a diagnosis of PE was a big deal. You had to do a, an angiogram. Nobody wanted to do that. So you only did it if the people were really sick, right? But now you had this new test, you could do it. At that time, I had no concerns about radiation or anything like that. But I didn't like to do big tests when I didn't need to. I've always been a sort of like, do I really need to do that? This person doesn't have a PE. Why would I do that? So I give her, I explain to her she's fine. And you know you've talked to patients many times, right, where you say, no, it's nothing. And sometimes they go, oh, great. And they're really happy. And sometimes they have that look. You, you know she ain't buying it. <laughs> So she's there with her husband, whom I also know, a really nice guy, and he's, he's got, like, great, okay, we can go home. <laughs> but she's like, no, 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 you know, I can tell, you know, her face got that look. So, so I say to her, um, <laughs> you know, at the time, they, I didn't know about shared decision-making, but I guess this was shared decision-making. I said to her, look, you know, I'm sure it's not. I'm not worried. You could go, we could do blah, 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 blah. But, you know, we have this new test called a CT pulmonary angiogram, and if, if you really want, I can do that test. I don't think you need it. I, it, I think it's irrelevant, but if you really want it, you can do it. And I, so I said, why don't you, I'll, I'll leave, go talk to your husband, talk it out, and then you guys decide, I'll be back in 10 minutes. So I come back in 10 minutes, and she says, we've decided we want the test. So I'm thinking to myself, this is really silly, but okay, you know, she, she's on staff here. What, you know, so, I got, so I get the CTPA. Um, what did it show? PE. PE. It showed a PE. It showed a small PE. Um, on the other side. <laughs> on the wrong side. I this swear to God, true. So um, <laughs> when I tell her it's on the wrong side, she says, you know, I think I might have had some pain on that side. too." <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, so I'm thinking like, holy mackerel, I can't believe this. This is completely the opposite of everything I know about PE. I've been practicing, you know, clinically for a long time, and oh my God, have I been missing all these cases? Did I just get saved? Well, you know, anyway, we admit her to the hospital, she gets treatment, etc. cetera. Um, so, let's talk about PE for a while. We'll come back to my friend later, okay? So let's talk about PE for a while. So um, before we get to PE, let's look at abstract number one is about the concept of overdiagnosis, and number two also. These are about the concept of overdiagnosis. So let's go back to overdiagnosis. Overdiagnosis is you find something. It is true. It's not a false positive, but it probably would never have caused any problems if you had never found it. Um, this is, if, for those of you who are interested in this topic, by the way, there's a book by a guy named Gil Welch called Overdiagnosed or Overdiagnosis or something like that, which is fabulous, really, really worth reading. It's, I, I, I wrote it down in there. You can look at it, but it's really, really a great read. Anyway, so um, the first couple of articles go over this concept and the basis for it, and there are many reasons to think that this actually exists, including it's not just prostate cancer, but many, many cancers. In fact, screening in general probably produces overdiagnosis most of the time. Why is that? Let's think about screening for a second. What is it about screening? What's the possible good and what's the possible harm in screening? So screening is I take a population of people who have no, I have no reason to believe they have anything, right? They're just a population of asymptomatic people, but I know amongst them there's somebody in there who has something that hasn't yet presented itself clinically, and the concept is if I find it early, maybe I can treat it. 
So assuming we have a, a, a thousand people, only one who has the disease, okay? Because most of them don't have it. That's why it's a screening test. Um, how much good can I do by doing my screening test? Okay, so what's the maximum good I could do? <coughs> if I have a great treatment that finding it early fixes it, and if I don't find it early, they die. What's the best I could do? One in a thousand. I can't help the other 999, they don't have anything, right? So um, how much harm could I do? How many, uh, what percentage of the thousand could I harm? A thousand. I can harm them all, right? Depending upon what I find and what my next step is. So a screening test, it starts out with terrible odds. It cannot do much good, but it has the potential to do lots of harm. Then if you think about good, it might probably isn't one out of a thousand. Why? Because some of those people probably won't go on to die anyway. And some of those who do have a real disease and would, of that one out of a thousand, now let's say 10,000, there are 10 of them, some of them would be fine, and some of them, they'll get symptomatic and then I can treat them and they'll do fine. Not everybody who waits to get treated symptomatically does poorly. So I can't, I'm, there's no way I'm gonna be one in a thousand, it's gotta be less than that. On the other hand, depending upon the test, unless it's a really fabulous test, there's gonna be a lot of positives. And those positives, I have the potential to hurt them all. So what are some examples? So um, in prostate cancer, finally in 2009, there were two large randomized trials of prostate cancer, as prostate cancer screening, one in Europe, one in America. What did they show? Anybody know? The one in America showed absolutely no effect, benefit on any outcome. That is, it seems like prostate cancer comes in two forms. The malignant form that's going to kill you, but even if you find it early, it's going to kill you. We can't affect that. And the other form, which is never going to hurt you. In fact, you'll never even know you have it. It just sits there. And that there are two very, very different versions of prostate cancer. So you do essentially no good. What's the harm? Well, about um, 10 to 20 percent of the people will end up having some invasive procedure. And many of the people who had, we're not helping anybody, and most of the people we, we do something to never would have known they were sick if we didn't do it, um, end up impotent or incontinent. <gasps> Because once you do any intervention, the rate of impotence and incontinence is 20 to 50 percent. It's really, really, really high. So we harm a lot of people. So that, study, that was predictable before the study came out. The European study was a little better results. There it was, you say one out of 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 people, one less person died of prostate cancer. Huge amounts of harm, one less death. Oh, by the way, the person who didn't die of prostate cancer died of something else. Overall mortality was the same. So two hugely, hugely, hugely terrible negative studies. Is this only prostate cancer? What about mammography? What are the results with mammography? Well, it turns out that, you know, there, five, three years ago, the, one of the U.S. Public Health Task Force made this, made this, revolutionary statement which said you should, you should screen women who are 50, screen women who are 60, but women who are 40, you should offer them screening but discuss it with them. And they got reamed for saying this. They're killing women, this is doing harm, it's really, really terrible. And I agreed that it was a stupid, terrible policy. But the reason it was a stupid, terrible policy was because it should have said every woman you should discuss it with her because you should discuss with her what are the potential harms and what are the potential benefits. So what is the potential benefit? It's a little more if you're 50 or 60 and it's a little less if you're 40. What is it? How many women do you have to screen to save one breast cancer death? It's in the thousands. Okay, that means the vast majority of women who are screened will not be benefited. It's not surprising, you run the numbers, <clears throat> it's almost inevitable. The vast majority won't benefit. But then you also find out how many will be harmed. So if you screen women 10 years, if you screen 1,000 women for 10 years every year, how many of them will have a positive mammogram? At least one. 50%. That means one of the women might benefit, 500 of the women are subjected to possible harm. Now, I'm not talking about 
cost and pain and all that other stuff. I'm talking about then they get a biopsy, and of those, some of them, okay, some of them have cancer. And then what happens? Well, it's estimated that there probably are 10 overdiagnosed cancers, that is cancer in quotes, but that they would never have known about in their life if, un, if they never got screening for every one cancer that they really would have. That's not for every one saved, that's for every one cancer because some of the cancers you fix anyway and some of the cancers go on to die anyway. And by the way, overall mortality is very questionable if there's any difference, any change. So the benefit is exquisitely small, the harm is pretty substantial. A lot of those women end up no breast. That's not trivial. The benefit, incredibly small. Now, it's a little better for a 60-year-old than it is for a 40-year-old, but it's the same for both of them. Lots and lots of potential harm, almost no benefit. When you say this in public, um, you're attacking women. Well, at least that's what a lot of, some of the breast cancer groups say. And so it, this is very volatile to, to say something like this, but the, 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 the data is pretty overwhelming. This, in Sweden, you know, big um, advocates of screening for years and generations, they've been at, they just stopped their breast cancer screening program. They said, wait, this is crazy. Is it just breast cancer and prostate cancer? No, it turns out for every cancer where it's been looked, it turns out there are, there's a whole reservoir of people who if you go looking, have the disease. You could take out people's thyroids, a lot of them have thyroid cancer way, 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 way more than the number who ever go on to have thyroid cancer clinically. So is it just cancer? Let's go back to PE for a little bit. Um, I want to go back to number two, which is an article I wrote in a minute, but before we do that, let's talk about PE. Number three, four, five, six, and probably 10 and 11, or 11 and 12. Talk, excuse me, 13 is the other good one. Talk about what are the numbers with PE. So, 30 years ago, what was the um, case fatality rate if you had a PE? You had a PE, how likely were you to die? <laughs> Not quite 99, but it's between 20 and 80%. So let's say 50%. I mean, you had a PE, you were really, really sick, okay? That's partly because we only diagnosed it in sick people, right? We didn't go looking in not so sick people. What's the case fatality rate today? When we diagnose a PE, how likely are you to die? It's a one one hundredth of that. It's somewhere between 0.2 and 0.5, 0.8%. Almost nobody dies. So if we've reduced the case fatality, what are the possible reasons? How did we do that? How do we get so much better, 100 times better, saving lives? One way is because we have much better treatment. What was the treatment 30 years ago? And okay, what's it today? It's exactly the same. There's been no change. We're not any better at treatment. We haven't actually saved any more lives than we ever did before. So how do we get so much better? Because we started diagnosing lots of people who never would have died. And these articles point out that if you actually look at deaths from PE, from PE the number of deaths from PE is exactly the same as it always was. There's been no change, population-based death from PE. We just diagnose it 100 times more. So what does that remind you of? Makes me think of overdiagnosis. We're diagnosing all these things. We've got a huge range of our people we're diagnosing. Outcomes are exactly the same. We're not doing anything different. It must be that if we hadn't made those diagnoses and the same number of people would have died, nothing would have changed. Oh, by the way, pulmonary hypertension, no change. It's not like we're finding more and treating more. It's, all the outcomes are exactly the same. We're just find, identifying more people with PE. There is one difference, though, in, in patient-oriented outcome. What's that? Harm from anticoagulation is doubled from anticoagulation of PE. We diagnose all these people. We treat them. Guess what happens? We hurt some of them. There's no difference in any, there's no benefit. So where does that sort of leave us? Um, let's go back to my patient now. How many, um, what's, what has her life been like in the last 30 years? What do you think? How many times has she been treated for PE? Every time she has anything, she's going to go to the ER, right? 
she had at that time. And when she goes to the ER, what's she going to say? I had a PE, and this is just like that. So what's going to happen? She's going to get treated a lot. Her chance of being harmed, she was a young lady at the time. What's the chance that I actually benefited her? Well, there's no way of knowing. Maybe she would have had a bad outcome. It's almost impossible, right? She almost certainly was overdiagnosed. This was something we found that true, true, and unrelated. Is, does it make sense that there's overdiagnosis in PE? Well, let's think back for a second. Let's go back to medical school. What's the function, what's one of the functions of the pulmonary vasculature? It's a filter. You're supposed to filter out clots before they get to the central circulation. Well, how could you filter out clots if there are none? Oh, it turns out we all have clots in the vasculature all the time. They're just little ones. As we get better and better at picking up little clots, guess what happens? We all will have PEs. Imagine if we had an electron microscope CAT scanner. Every patient would have PE. And then what would happen? You'd have a patient who comes in, like my lady, and you'd say, oh, I heard about that case. Where it had nothing. It was just a little sticky pen. It was a PE. I better go get it. And then guess what? It'll be positive. And then you'll say, well, if that's positive, maybe silent is positive. So everybody in the waiting room will get the scanner. And guess what? We'll all, and we'll all be in the hospital. And will we have helped anybody? Or will we have hurt people? Well, the, the, the bottom line is the more, the better we get at finding more and more trivial findings, the more harm we're going to do. Because the vast majority of them would never go on to anything. They're normal. Oh, by the way, we know this as well from once we started doing ultrasounds in post-op patients. We started finding clots in thousands and thousands of people. And we started treating them all. And then it turns out that the, the number of people who post-op actually went on to have disease before we started looking was almost zero. It happened, but it was extraordinarily rare. So the vast majority of those clots we're finding clearly never in the past, when we didn't look for them, never went on to cause any problem. But by finding them, now we're in trouble, because what are we going to do? So the, the, the bottom lines are, we are finding more and more things that we call disease, because under the microscope, when you actually do the screening for prostate cancer and you biopsy it, a lot of times it is prostate cancer. It's not like a false positive, it is prostate cancer. It just isn't malignant. And when we find these clots, they are real clots. They're just not important clots. They're not pathologic clots. They go away. But once we find them, what do we do now? This is only going to get worse as we get better at looking. Not only will we find more and more, but, we'll, but our threshold for looking will get less and less. Oh my God, I gotta look at everybody. And then we'll keep finding it and we'll say, oh, I'm glad I looked. When you interview men who are now impotent because they got PSA screening and they were fine and now they're cancer victims and impotent, what do they say? Thank you for saving my life. And when you say, even the ones who learn that you didn't save their life, that this is nothing, they say, well, it's one in a thousand, one in a hundred lives you saved, but I'm the one. So this is a real problem. Now, go ahead. Do you know the numbers for colon cancer screening? Colon cancer screening, you, the number needed to screen to save one life. Colon cancer is like the poster child for a really good screening test because you do save lives. You save one life for every 5,000 people you screen. At best, for five to 10 years. It may be much worse than that, maybe 20,000. But 5,000, let's say. In that time, three people will have a colostomy because of perforation from screening. So you'll have three colostomies for one that you saved. 5,000 people will have unpleasantness, cost, time. I don't know the number, but a lot of them will have to come back for a second test, etc. Many biopsies, etc. Oh, by the way, there also is no evidence that you save overall mortality at all. You decrease colon cancer mortality, overall mortality is the same. How is it compared to blood? They're the same. Basically the same. You need to screen zillions of people to save one. The downstream harm is 
pretty substantial. The overall benefit is unclear. It's just colon cancer benefit. That's where the benefit is. Um, but it's a little less invasive. So if I were to do it, so, you know, I basically say people should get to decide for themselves. You know, are, are you so afraid of, price, of colon cancer that you want to do this? But imagine if I took a room of 5,000 people and said, in here, in this room, we're going to do all this test on all of you every year. It's cost you money, lots of discomfort, blah, blah, blah. And one of you in here will not die from colon cancer. You'll die from something else. The other 4,999 will get no benefit. How many people would volunteer? We don't say that, right? We say, oh, you're 50, you need colonoscopy. This will, of course, get worse when we get a better colonoscopy test. Because then we'll find, now we find polyps. Then we'll find all sorts of incipient lesions. Oh my God, look at that. There are three cells that are mitotic. You have cancer. Let's take it out. Let's take out your colon. It's, this is a real problem. And it's not just PE. PE is a great example in emergency medicine. And it's not just cancer. It's not just screening. And the big news is that in America, in the West, we believe technology will solve all our problems. And technology will make this much, much worse. The better the technology, the worse this will be. We also believe, we blindly believe, that earlier is better. It's not better. It's only better if it is, and it almost never is. You need very special circumstances for earlier to be better. Most of the time, earlier means more. More is usually less means the opportunity to do harm with almost no chance to do benefit. What are some other examples in emergency medicine? I'll give you one, then I'm going to ask you for the other big one that you should all think of. Other examples of overdiagnosis. So here's one. What does it mean when somebody's herniating? What does that mean to you? That means they're about to die. I can't think of anything worse, right? That's the end, right? They're herniating their brain. Okay, that's bad, right? We had the Nexus database. We had all these people we did CAT scans on for a million reasons. And before we did the CAT scan, we, we collected information on them, CAT scans of their brain. This is the Nexus 2 that had one. And we collected information about their clinical presentation, why they got the CAT scan, what their neurologic exam was like, what their mental status was like, et cetera. We knew all that. It wasn't like we're trying to get it from a chart. It was prospectively recorded. We then got together a bunch of experts and we said, Radiolo neuroradiologists, neurosurgeons, and emergency physicians said, define for us what is herniation on a CT scan. When you look at a CT scan, you say, oop, herniation, what does that mean? So they, they said, if you have this, if you have that, if you have this, the combination of things, and they hashed it out in a formal process, and they came up with a list of things that said, if you have these, you're herniating. And then we went back and looked, blinded to this, blinded to any clinical data, at the CT scans of the people who had gotten a CT scan and then compared it, which ones of those were herniating according to these criteria, and then we compared it to their physical exam. So we found that something like 15% of the people who got a CT scan had evidence on the CT scan of herniation. Only about 1% were really sick. Huge number of people had herniation on the CT scan, including Something like 10% of the herniation, people who were herniating, had normal mental status and normal neurologic exam. Now, you can interpret that two ways. One is that the CT scan is stupid. <laughs> or the other way, that it's overdiagnosed. It is herniation. That's what her Yes, technically, there are signs of the brain moving from one compartment to the next, where it shouldn't be. But it that can't mean herniation like you and I know it. They're awake and alert. They're not, imagine if we then said, when we tried to publish this, they didn't want to publish it because we said, this is overdiagnosis. And this means that the CT scan is dangerous because it'll get you to do all sorts of bad things. Imagine if you intervene because the person's herniating when he's normal. We have to intubate you and give you mannitol, sir. Sorry. <laughs> you do a lot of harm, right? The journals that we sent it to all wanted us to say, this shows that clinical exam is inadequate and you have to do CT scans on everyone, including normal people, because they might be herniating. <laughs> so what's a, what are some other examples in emergency medicine of overdiagnosis? 
vertebral artery dissection, great. We never used to look for that. We only look for it in really sick people. Outcomes were really, really, really bad. Nowadays, it's quite clear that we diagnose vertebral artery dissection a thousand times more frequently than they used to. We never knew about all those other hidden a thousand cases because they must never have gotten sick. Now we diagnose them all the time and you read the, the textbooks and they all say they need all sorts of interventions. They obviously don't. The vast majority obviously are silent because we never found them before and they never, we're now finding them for, only because we can. It's a great example. What's a really big one besides P that happens every day, the most important one in the emergency department? Coronary artery disease. We have all sorts of people who are normal, who have no risk chest pain that you send to OBS. I know they're normal because you sent them to OBS. <laughs> if they had any chance of being sick, you would have sent them to the CCU. <laughs> you know they're normal. We all know they're normal. We send them to OBS and then because we, you know, one in a zillion might have something, we do tests. And guess what? The tests identify coronary artery disease all the time. And then what do we do? We do stents and interventions. And then we say it's really good because the case fatality rate has gone down. Very few of them are dying. That's because they don't have a disease. Well, yes, they do have coronary artery disease. You define it as plaque in their vessel. We all have plaque in our vessel if you're over 30. The more we look, the more we, the, and the better of tools we look with, the more harm we will do. Um, I'll give you one last example and then I'll stop. Um, imagine, this is something I wrote in, in number two as a hypothetical thing. Imagine we have a disease, a really bad infectious disease that kills half the people who get it. Okay, and let's call it infectiosis. It's a really bad infectious disease. And so you have 100 people with infectiosis, 50 of them die. We discover a new antibiotic, really fabulous antibiotic. It's so strong, we call it gorillasolin. We give gorillasolin to infectiosis, it saves half the people. So instead of 50 dying, only 25 die. But it's such a powerful antibiotic, it kills five out of every 100 people who get it. Okay, so you save 25, you kill five, you save 20 out of 100. There's no drug in the world that that's, that's that good, right? Fabulous. It's a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous drug. Yes, it's dangerous, but you give it to these people, you're saving 20% of the people. What other treatment do we ever have that saves 20% of, of people? Now imagine we get a new screening test or a new diagnostic test that's really good at identifying infectiosis. And it identifies it really, really early. So it identifies in people who have a cold. And it turns out that we identify lots and lots and lots of them that we never knew about before. Now we have 100 people. Of those 100 people, two would go on to get sick, to get real infectiosis. But they all have the disease. They all have infectiosis under the microscope. Now we give them our wonder drug. What happens now? Instead of two dying, one dies. 50% decrease in mortality. Oh, by the way, we kill five because the drug doesn't care whether you're sick or not, if it kills you. Now we've changed the best drug in history to an absolute uh, catastrophe. Killing four people for nothing. That's what we're facing. So, the last thing, I gotta say this, sorry, I have to go over, I'll, I'll, I'll make it up later. Because um, <laughs> I go last, so I'll, I'll, I'll do that. So, um, here's the, the, the really, the, the, so how do we fix this? So some people say, one of the articles in here is by Russell Hull and Paul Stein, the two biggest gurus in pulmonary embolism. And they said, subsegmental clots, you know, a lot of them probably are overdiagnosis and probably shouldn't worry about them. So maybe when you see a subsegmental clot, don't treat it. Is that feasible? Imagine you go looking for a P, you find it. Are you gonna really say, eh, let's not treat it? I don't think so. Then the last article, which came out after I wrote this chapter, but it's really important, is by Dan Exter in Blood in August of 2013. They looked in Europe where they're much, much more careful about looking for PEU than we are. In the United States today, about the people we look, only about 5% of them rule in. 8%, something like that. In Europe, they 20, 25, 30% rule in. So they look when the person's sick. They looked at a group which was sick, 
All the people had clinical signs of PE. Then they found PE in 25% of them, and then they looked at their outcomes. What were the outcomes in the people who had a subsegmental clot versus the people who had a big clot? What, were the, what was the relative outcomes? You had a big clot versus you had a small clot. They were the same. Just as many people died, just as many people ended up complicated with respiratory failure, et cetera, intubated, all those things. Why is that? Because you learned in medical school that it isn't this clot that kills you, it's the next one. So just because this, this clot is small doesn't mean you don't have anything. So what is the real solution? It isn't that you look at the size of the clot and decide is that dangerous or not. It's whom, in whom do you start the workup? If you do the workup in sick people, you find a small clot, it's important. If you do the workup in healthy people, like we do in the United States today, we do it in no-risk patients all the time, when you find things, they're meaningless. Not only do we find clots way, way, way less frequently because we work up so many people, but undoubtedly, most of the people we find it in, it's overdiagnosed. It isn't really a disease. It's way worse than 25% versus 5% because most of our 5% is probably trivial. So the only solution to this, the only solution to this is to say no. Just say no. Don't work up people who aren't sick. Once you work it up, you're screwed. They're screwed. Sorry. You're not screwed. It's in our advantage to, to do it. Nobody will blame us. But it's really bad. So I think this, is, uh, this train has left the station. It's already terrible. And we're already buying into it and making it worse with all the ways we work up no-risk patients for all the diseases that we have. For sepsis, there's another great example. Anyway, we have to do better. Otherwise, we are going to end up, as technology gets better, meeting Iona Heath's wonderful comment when she wrote about this. She's the head of the Royal College of General Practice. She said, medicine's wonderful ability to heal the sick is being overwhelmed by our ability to harm the healthy. So it's up to us, and there's only one way out, which is to do less, not to go looking where the patient is well. Isn't there too much uh, medical uh, or legal issues with doing less? Yes, uh, you're right that it, it, so here's the real, the bottom line is, Every incentive on you is to do more. No one will blame you. They will blame you if you miss something. It's easier. It's easy to write, get a CT scan than it is to talk to a patient. It's, there is no legal consequence. Every, all of it, we get paid more. You find a fee, you get paid much more. All of the, for us, it's better to, to be mindless. The only problem is you made a promise when you went to medical school, when you first became a doctor, you made a promise to put your patient's interest first. That's what it is to be a professional. That's the core of being a professional, is when my interest and my patient's interest conflicts, I have to do what's in my patient's interest. And it's terribly against our patient's interest to do this. So we have to decide whether we have the courage to say, I'm not going to do it even though it poses a threat to me. That's really the bottom line. Sure. How many of us would have those sub well, we know a lot of things. Like, for example, subarachnoid hemorrhage. We're talk, always talking about that. We'll just do the CT. Two to five percent of us have a little aneurysm in our brain. We have a, a non-headache. That's another great example of overdiagnosis. We have a, a mild headache that means nothing. If we look at 100 people, two to five of them will, will make a diagnosis that's wrong. We'll subject them to surgery for no reason. So the only way to do this well is to limit the people you work up. It's not just CTLP, it's nothing if they don't need it. That's the critical part. 